All right, welcome back to another set of notes here. We're starting with historical periods two. Uh, this set of notes is going to seem a little bit long just because we gotta give you background on everything that happens in periods two. So we're gonna provide some context here. The learning objective 2.A uh, says, explain the context for the colonization of North America from 1607 to 1754. Those are the years which encompass all of period two and let's get to it. So the first key concept says Europeans develop a variety of colonization and migration patterns influenced by different imperial goals, cultures, and the varied North American environments where they settled and they competed with each other and American Indians for resources. So we're gonna see this key concept uh, for the next couple of slides and we're gonna go individually by each European power that was in the new world. Spain has a lot of continuity from the first historical period. So we know that the migrations are coming uh, are mostly dominated by men. And because they are mostly single men, when they settle down, they intermarry with the natives, which leads to a very complex system of castes. The French um, are going to settle down in Quebec in 1608. That's going to be their very first permanent settlement. And they will claim uh, large, some of the largest amounts of territory in the New World, rivaling uh, with Spain. And they will come through the St. Lawrence Seaway into the Great Lakes. They'll also um, hop over you know, through the land, reach the Mississippi, and then make their way all the way down the Mississippi eventually. And the economic activity that they were mostly there for is the beaver fur trade. So the French that would go to the New World, they were called Cour de Bois. And that is French for runners of the woods because you have to run through the woods in order to find the beaver or the animals because uh, there were other animals like badgers and mongoose who uh, they would catch and take the fur so that they could send back to make into gloves and hats and other fashionable items. They are going to have good amicable relations with Native Americans because they will use the Native Americans as trading partners to get more furs, and they will go as far as settling down and intermarrying with the Native Americans. The Dutch, uh, they will settle down in modern day New York, at the time they called it New Netherlands, uh, and they will travel up the Hudson River Valley, but overall they will have fewer Dutch people migrate to the New World. Uh, even though they are there for the same reasons as the French, is to, to get furs and export back to Europe, they will have fewer marriages with the natives. Um, they will create an incentive program called uh, patroonships to try and get people to settle down along the Hudson River Valley, and that will have mixed success. Um, they do absorb the Swedish explorations in North America in 16. 55, but later they're going to be absorbed themselves by the English in 1664. Um, so some of the pictures that you see here on the screen, the first uh, large one is obviously the map to show you where they settled. Um, and then the uh, symbol that they used for uh, New Amsterdam, which was the city of that we now call New York, um, has the beaver front and center to show you uh, really what their goals were. And the uh, document here in the top left is actually the deed of sale for the island of Manhattan. And the island of Manhattan was uh, exchanged between the Dutch and Native Americans for uh, something that would be roughly around $1,000 today. So now moving on to the British, uh, we're gonna see a mix of single males and family units migrating depending on the region that they settle in, whether it be New England, the middle colonies, or the plantation southern colonies. Um, but the majority of the colonies are going to be based in agriculture, whether they grow cash crops like tobacco or food crops like wheat uh, and other cereal crops. In New England, they will practice shipbuilding just because the land is not very uh, good. And because they were there in order to farm and they needed the land, to farm on, they are going to run into a more antagonistic relationship uh, over land with Native Americans. So this is seen in the uh, first permanent settlement in Jamestown. Uh, John Smith gets into an altercation with uh, the Powhatan tribe, and this is where Pocahontas symbolically uh, steps in between her father and John Smith and saves him uh, from being killed by the Powhatan tribe. 
All right, so now we're gonna talk about the goals of each of these uh, European powers. So very similar to the last set of slides, we're gonna go country by country. The key concept is Spanish, French, Dutch, and British colonizers had different economic and imperial goals involving land and labor that shaped the social and political development of their colonies, as well as their relationships with native populations. So here we're seeing how their imperial goals are going to affect the character of the colonies. So for Spain, we remember from the first historical period that it was gold, God, and glory. So they're continuing to try and get these resources. That's going to lead them to continue to use enslaved labor uh, in mines, enslaved labor in the sugarcane plantations. And for their religious conversion attempts, they're going to uh, establish the mission system uh, in, in full during this historical period. Uh, you'll see the mission system be established up the coast of California from San Diego uh, as far north as San Francisco. Uh, because the French were there to trade pelts with natives, uh, they end up decimating some beaver populations in what is now the Midwest. Uh, and their continued interaction and trade with Native Americans introduces Native Americans to alcohol and diseases, which is also going to hurt their populations. Now, the Dutch had um, more than just their colonies in North America. They had uh, colonies in South America and what is now Indonesia. And because of those lucrative ventures in the East Indies and Brazil, uh, they didn't really pay too much attention to their colonies in North America so that when the English took over the Dutch colonies uh, in New Amsterdam and New Netherlands, uh, they didn't really miss them so much. Um, as far as what it was like in New Amsterdam under Dutch control, it was run like a company town. They were there to make money and so therefore uh, self-government and you know freedoms that uh, people will come to expect in British North America are not found. Um, as far as relations with natives, we can see from this map of the island of Manhattan, the um, end here, you can see uh, they built fortifications, uh, a wall that kind of uh, divides the Dutch settlement and the rest of the island of Manhattan. And this is what's going to become um, a Wall Street in New York City today. So that's where Wall Street got its name. It's from the wall that the Dutch built to protect themselves from native attacks. Uh, then for the British, the British uh, came to North America for a diverse amounts of different um, purposes. So you have people that are coming uh, to get land for themselves. So land issues become very important. So squatters, especially in North Carolina, are going to try and um, get uh, legitimacy for the land that they have began to settle on and that's going to lead to issues with Native Americans that previously occupied that land. Colonies like Pennsylvania and Maryland that were settled by uh, Quakers and Catholics respectively are going to try and attract a more diverse group of people from Europe because of the uh, acceptance of different religious groups. So you see a, a law uh, of Maryland concerning religion. That's the uh, acts of toleration that they pass in order to try and protect Catholics in the colony of Maryland. On the bottom right, uh, the Quakers, led by uh, William Penn, are exchanging uh, goods with Native Americans for the colony of Pennsylvania. And so you can see that the, the relationships across the colonies with Native Americans varied depending on the purpose for settlement in these regions. In New England, the colonies have the goal of settlement there for religious persecution. So you had separatists and Puritans that were trying to uh, either separate completely from the Church of England or purify the Church of England and make it less like the Catholic Church, establish the colonies in New England. That, so that means that they are going to establish colonies with governments that are led by congregation members. And so that's going to be um, unique to their character. So next we have uh, in the 17th century, early British colonies developed along the Atlantic coast with regional differences that reflected various environmental, economic, cultural, and demographic factors. So we're going to introduce the three different groups of colonies. So we'll have the Chesapeake and the Southern colonies, the middle colonies, and then the New England colonies. The Chesapeake colonies is where Jamestown was first settled. So um, 
they had the lowest life expectancy out of all the other colonies, and that is partly due to the geography. So it's a very swampy area, and because of the swampiness, um, diseases like uh, dysentery and malaria became very common, and um, it decimated the population of the English settlers early on, and it wasn't uh, until the 1700s that people became accustomed to the living conditions. Because it was so swampy, we'll see later on that uh, we'll have runaway enslaved people uh, will hide out in the swampy areas of the Chesapeake. Um, the people that lived in this area was made mostly tobacco growers uh, and indentured servants before there was uh, full-blown enslaved labor. And the growing use of enslaved labor only happened after Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. So we'll talk more about Bacon's Rebellion and how it was a large group of landless men in Virginia that wanted to uh, get the governor to expand the colony and expand the protection in order for them to be able to plant uh, in what used to be Native American territory. The middle colonies, uh, so this is like uh, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, they uh, were also very agricultural, but they were planting mostly cereal crops. So they became known as the breadbasket of the 13 colonies because they were really uh, growing the most amounts of food. They were more diverse due to the uh, old Dutch settlements in New York. And uh, when William Penn was recruiting for people to come to his new colony, he was recruiting from all over Europe and he was um, trying to incentivize people by giving them healthy amounts of land. And so now for New England, uh, there was not good soil as there was in the middle colonies and in the plantation colonies. Uh, the soil was a lot more rocky, uh, but because of the uh, natural harbors that were along the coast of New England, uh, shipbuilding and timber became the main industries. Uh, we said that the Puritans and the Separatists were the ones that mostly lived in New England. And so their religious lifestyle influenced patterns of living. Uh, they created a church or a congregation hall uh, in every town that they created. They lived closer together than people did in the middle colonies or in the southern colonies. And uh, they were fewer enslaved Africans also because uh, there was no necessity for it in the land. It wouldn't have been profitable for them to purchase uh, enslaved labor when their farm operations were not as large or as profitable as the middle of the southern colonies. Now the next key concept is competition over resources between European rivals and American Indians encouraged industry and trade and led the conflict in the Americas. We will see this throughout the 13 colonies, uh, the British colonies. In the Chesapeake area, we already talked about the Anglo-Powhatan Wars in the early 1600s uh, around the area of Jamestown. And that was uh, a caused by settlers trying to continue to expand further into Native American land to plant more tobacco. In New England, uh, we also had problems with Native Americans, Pequot War in 1637, uh, in which the Pequots were uh, expelled from the land in New England uh, and the attacks that the Puritans led uh, turned into massacres in which they would also kill uh, women and children after they would burn the villages. Uh, in 1657, we have a conflict in New England again, uh, this time led by Medicom. He was called King Philip uh, by the Puritans. And so sometimes it's called uh, King Philip's War. And this was the last attempt to end English expansion. Medicom uh, was able to get a multi-tribe alliance to try and combat British expansion, uh, but they failed. Uh, Medicom is captured, he's beheaded, and his head is put on a stake for all to see uh, in the town of Plymouth. Uh, next key concept, the British colonies participated in political, social, and cultural and economic exchanges with Great Britain that encouraged both stronger bonds with Britain and resistance to Britain's control. So this key concept really talks about the changing relationship between Britain and its colonies. Um, we'll talk about all the different events that happen that will make that uh, relationship stronger and then what will make it uh, weaker that will eventually lead us to the revolution in 1776. But first, we have the Navigation Acts in 1651. This was caused by the Anglo-Dutch Wars. Uh, England goes to war with uh, the Dutch. And um, in order to try and 
hurt the Dutch Empire and get the most benefit from their colonies, England passes the Navigation Acts, which is going to prohibit the colonies from trading with the Dutch or transporting British goods on Dutch ships. Uh, this is part of a larger mercantilist system in which the mother country is going to get the benefit or all of the benefit from their colonies. But uh, through periods of sal salutary neglect, uh, the enforcement of the Navigation Acts uh, doesn't always happen and there's uh, quite a lot of smuggling of British goods onto non-British ships. We're going to have a realignment of colonial governments over time. Uh, in which the uh, British monarchs are going to want to have more control uh, like they did over uh, the Dominion of New England in which they merge all those colonies together and then other periods, uh, especially through the 1700s in which they just let the colonies uh, govern themselves. And so we'll have uh, colonial legislatures become accustomed to having home rule and having uh, dominion over their own affairs so that uh, in the 1770s, when we'll get to it, uh, they will resent the British Empire for trying to control them. Next key concept here is the transatlantic commercial, religious, philosophical, and political exchanges led residents of the British colonies to evolve in the political and cultural attitudes as they became increasingly tied to Britain and one another. So we're going to have a religious movement that comes from Britain and then really takes hold in the 13 colonies. It's the first great awakening and it's a Protestant revival that goes across all of the colonies. Uh, the two people that you should associate with it are Jonathan Edwards. He was uh, from the British colonies. Um, his sermon, Sinners at the Hands of an Angry God, uh, became widely read across the colonies. And then George Whitfield, uh, who was from England, traveled all through the colonies. And because of his movement throughout, this became the first shared movement amongst all the British colonies, which kind of starts to lead to a growing uh, shared identity between the colonies. And then finally, like other European empires in the Americas that participated in the Atlantic slave trade, the English colonies developed a system of slavery that reflected the specific economic, demographic, and geographic characteristics of those colonies. So this is really just saying that slave labor is going to take hold in the British colonies, uh, especially in the colonies that practice agriculture. So tobacco being the main cash crop being grown in the Chesapeake area, um, in the Carolinas, the plantation owners were looking for enslaved people that had experience growing rice in Africa. And that's also going to lead to an increase in demand for enslaved labor. And then as they get to the British colonies and they begin to outnumber the white settlers, in order to uh, maintain control of the colonies and keep the enslaved labor in bondage, they are going to enact slave codes uh, that are going to try and control the enslaved population. All right, so that was it. The quick recap here is each European exploration and colonization effort was unique. So you need to be able to differentiate what was unique about each one. The British colonies developed into three distinct groups. That's the New England colonies, the middle colonies, and the Southern plantation colonies. The relations with natives varied with each European power depending on their economic goals. Britain arguably had the worst relationship with them. Uh, and while some like the uh, French intermarried and also the Spanish intermarried, having more amicable relations in various instances. Britain's relationship with its colonies will change over the 17th and 18th century, and then the British colonies will begin to utilize enslaved African labor. So that is it for this set of slides. Uh, we will continue on with period two in the next lecture.